Okay. So those are the three main operations that we do here. Each one has its advantages and disadvantages. This takes 90 minutes. This takes 30 minutes. This takes 40 or 50 minutes. This has a connection here and a connection here. No connections. No connections. Each one of these connections, just like any welding job, any plumbing job, could potentially leak. And leak is the boogeyman over here. Leak is the thing we worry the most about. Happens in about one in 300 cases these days, usually up here. And usually we find it within the first couple of days, it's something that happens you know, in, in the beginning. And if it's there, we have to go back and fix it. And our philosophy on leaks is if we think twice about it, we're probably going to put the scopes back in and look. Because we know the earlier we get to it, the better the patient does, the less interruption in their clinical course. So early is like, everybody's smiling, this one won't smile. I'm worried about that one. Or everybody's walking fast, this one's walking slow. You know, that one's got to leak until I prove that they don't. You know, that's when we want to find it, when somebody's just not getting better as quick as everybody else. Uh, and usually we have to go back to the operating room and fix it. Uh, leaks over here, very rare. One in 15,000. But I know of a death from a leak of a lap band. It can happen. Just very, very uncommon. You know, this is a medical device. This is a piece of plastic. This is a foreign body. You know, this is a, a piece of plastic in your body now. So like any uh, medical device, whether it's an artificial heart valve, artificial hip, artificial knee, breast implant, it almost always goes good. But the rule about any implanted device is if it ever gets involved in an infection, if it ever gets bacteria on it, it usually has to come all the way out. All the antibiotics in the world won't clear up that infection until the foreign body is removed, until the splinter is removed. So infection is the boogeyman over here. Usually about one in 100 cases. Bacteria from the skin get on the port, bacteria from the gut get on the band, and we have to take it out and start again. Again, this usually happens in the beginning. Once you're past that beginning phase, it gets very, very uncommon. Um, this part of the stomach is called the greater, lesser curve, the lesser curve. This part of the stomach is called the greater curve. This is a stretchy part. This is the part that will stretch all the way into your pelvis on Thanksgiving or Pizza Hut nights. And when we, do, when we put in the band, we actually take part of this stomach and we bring it up like a wave and sew it above the band. And we do that in the whole front part of the stomach covers the band with a layer of stomach, gives the band a tunnel to live in so that it doesn't move up or down, okay? It kind of holds it in place. But in spite of that, every now and then we'll get somebody who'll come in and it's usually after a bad episode of flu or food poisoning with violent vomiting. They come in and say, food doesn't feel so good anymore and we do an x-ray and, and now they got a big pouch of stomach above the band and it's trapping food. Stomach has slipped up through the band and gotten trapped above the band. And when that happens, that's called a band slip. And this happens in about one in 30 cases. And it can happen at any time. And you know, everything's going good, and then you have uh, bad episodes of vomiting, and now food doesn't feel good, and we do the x-ray, we find the slip, and usually we just put the scopes, we have to put the scopes back in, unbuckle the band, pull that part of the stomach down, replace the band. Usually we can salvage the band but it usually requires an operation when it happens. But when you hear about a band slip, that's what that is, is actually stomach slipping up through the band and getting trapped above the band. Something we worry about, but very rarely ever see, is that in some patients, just the constant pressure of this balloon up against the wall of the stomach can erode through the wall of the stomach to where a patient comes in and says, I don't feel so good anymore, and we look inside with a scope, and on the inside we can see plastic the stomach has, or the band has eroded through the wall of the stomach. And when that happens, it's called an erosion. And this is way less than one in a hundred cases. But when it happens, the band has to come out because now the bacteria from your mouth are in contact with that plastic. Okay? So these are kind of the band-specific problems. Um, with the bypass, leak is the thing we worry about the most about. Probably the most common complication we see is that in some people, the opening between the upper pouch and the intestine heals too small. I make it 12 millimeters. I know it's 12 millimeters because there's a 12 millimeter tube through it when I put in my last stitch and tie my last knot. And then we take out that tube. But um, this is living tissue and it, it's been cut and sewn, so it's going to swell for a while. It's been injured. And so that swelling makes that opening smaller. So we'll send you home on a liquid diet, 
then we have you on these high protein shakes, and then applesauce, mashed potatoes, yogurt, soft cooked foods, regular chow. Kind of bring your diet back over six weeks, kind of like a broken jaw diet. And that's to let the swelling go out of that. But in some people, the, the, during that liquid phase, that opening heals so good that it, it, it gets small enough to handle the liquids, but too small for solid foods. And then when you get to solid foods, nothing feels good. And we look in there with a scope, and instead of being 12 millimeters, it's 4 millimeters. Through the scope, we have a balloon, like an angioplasty balloon, that we pass through that opening and give it a stretch, and that usually takes care of it. Okay. So when that happens, we call it a stricture. probably about one in 30, one in 50 cases. Usually happens about six to eight weeks out when you're just trying to experiment with solid foods and nothing feel, you can't make that jump back to solid foods. And then we can usually take care of it with a single endoscopy. Very uncommon to have to do it twice. Um, some vitamins and iron are most efficiently absorbed in this first one foot and the food doesn't drive by there anymore. So after gastric bypass surgery, you're going to be required to take a good multivitamin with iron for the rest of your life. Okay, we'll send you home on a Bugs Bunny chewable, and then at six weeks, you switch to a Centrum, a Myers, a Rexall. They're all pretty much an overdose. But it's going to be a two-step process now because you're going to have to buy them and take them. And if you do both steps, the vitamin deficiencies are very rare. Okay, so if you have gastric bypass surgery, you're committing to a good multivitamin. Okay. Um, some patients, it's, and it's usually young women with super heavy periods, sometimes need extra iron after this. And if there's an iron problem, it's usually that you know young woman with heavy periods who's kind of been borderline anemic all her life. Um, acid is made in the lower part of the stomach. Still works, still makes acid. But this acid can no longer reach your esophagus. So after gastric bypass surgery, the heartburn is gone on the first day. For some people, that's a really important improvement after their bariatric surgery. No, no more heartburn or reflux. But because the acid is made in the lower part of the stomach and the food doesn't go by there anymore, food doesn't mix with the acid, neutralize the acid, buffer the acid, um, that it's important after gastric bypass surgery that you avoid medicines that have a bad reputation for causing ulcers. And the main criminals are the ibuprofens, Motrin, Aleve, Advil, and aspirin. These medicines through your bloodstream turn off the stomach's ability to make mucus. Mucus lines the stomach, protects it from its own acid. And the ibuprofens turn that off. Aspirin turns that off. That's why we all get upset stomach from too much Motrin, too much aspirin. And the, um, uh, because of that, um, there's sort of an increased risk of ulcer production after gastric bypass. So we try to get all of our patients to avoid the ibuprofens after the operation. Uh, almost everybody that comes to us is taking these things regularly because this 100-pound backpack is killing your hips and killing your knees and killing your lower back. Uh, but I think you'll find that those things get better very quickly as your weight starts to come down. But avoiding the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines. Um, with the sleeve, this is a long staple line. This is a long suture line. I suppose a long weld. A long weld has a higher risk of leaking than a short weld. So leak is the thing I worry the most about. Uh, probably be about the same as this. Uh, we've had a couple of patients early who had some, uh, they developed like a narrowed area in the, in the middle that we would go down with our scope and a balloon and give a stretch and had to do that a couple times. Um, stricture. Um, This is reversible. Everything is still here. We didn't take out anything. It's hard to do. It's a big deal to do. I think twice in 13 years I've had to reverse one of these. This is easy to reverse. Put the scopes in, cut the band, pull on it, pops right out. This is gone. <laughs> okay, so this is a commitment. Okay, we take, this is the only thing, only operation we really take something out of your body. We can turn this into a gastric bypass if we need to, but, but that's a real commitment because this is gone, taken out of your body. Uh, probably the main problem with the sleeve these days is to try to get the insurance carriers to cover it. And they're sort of in a state of flux right now. They're really changing their policies on it week by week uh, to where it's, uh, most carriers, will, I think, will probably make this a, a, 
a primary operation. You'll have a choice of it. Some insurance carriers want to just restrict this to people.